I want to talk to you today about how you can discover and know and live your life congruent with the gifting, with the gifting that God has given to you. Understanding your spiritual gifts will give you great confidence in knowing who you are in Christ. It'll help you to understand God's will. It'll help you to get along with others. So let's dive into our text. And just by the way, we're looking at a slightly different passage today than might be your assigned text, but uh, it'll be an introduction to us on what the Bible teaches about spiritual gifts. And as you can see, I'm looking at the paraphrase from the message. Let's look at our text. You can easily see how this kind of thing, the understanding of spiritual gifts, work by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, there's still just one body. It's exactly the same way with the body of Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives, our disconnected lives. We each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at the one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, they're no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes uh, you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess, I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like eye, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head. Would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If it was all ear, how could it smell? But as it is, you see that God has carefully placed each part of his body right where he wanted it to be. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each in its proper size and in its proper place. No part is more, impo more important on its own. Well, with that introduction, I want to make 12 points, 12 points about spiritual gifts today. And the first one is, ignorance is not bliss. And I'll go to back to the first verse in this passage and quote from the NIV now. But 1 Corinthians 12, 1 says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Are you uninformed? Do you have any of your people in your group that are uninformed? If so, I want to equip you today and I want you to equip your people. So at the end of the day, they will either know their spiritual gifts or at least know how they can discover their spiritual gifts and will be motivated to do so. We do not want you to be uninformed. Ignorance is not bliss. Number two, everyone has at least one gift. Every believer has at least one gift. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. I draw your attention to those words. Each one, every one of us has at least one spiritual gift. Number three, no one has all the gifts. Verses 8 through 10, to one there is given to the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge, by means of the same Spirit, to another faith, by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, by the one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another to, inter to the interpretation of tongues. In Romans 12, we see a similar list. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of you. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. And let let me pause right there and say this is a good illustration of the idea that many of all of us are commanded, all of us are commanded to serve. Uh, and, and the idea of that, that word has to do with meeting the physical needs of others. And all of us are commanded to have a servant's art and a participate in serving. But for some people, it is a special thing that we would devote ourselves to. And that is true of many of the things in this list. Look at uh, encouraging. All of us are commanded to encourage, but, but for some of us, it is the main thing that we do. All of us are commanded to give, but for some of us, it is the main thing that we do. 
Anyway, getting back to our list, if it is teaching, then, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give gener- generously. If it is to lead, then do so diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. And draw your attention to one other thing about this list here, and that's the list of leadership. It is arguably the most important one in the list because leadership makes the other gifts possible. Leadership makes the other gifts possible. In other words, one of the roles of a leader is the ability to recruit to identify the gifting and the people who can serve in other ways. And the gifting, the, the gift of leader tends to unleash the other gifts in the body of Christ. Observation number four, gifts make us feel that we matter. They make us understand, maybe I should say, that we m- matter. 1 Corinthians 12, 14, I want you to think about how this all makes you feel more significant, not less. And in a complimentary way, gifts also make us feel that others matter. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. Sixth observation, gifts ultimately are not about you. Now, to each one is the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Why? For the common good. Gifts are not ultimately about you. Number seven, we are part of this body, but we are also part of the larger worldwide army of Christ. And I think that, uh, that my, one of my favorite verse, it is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And our understanding of the church came in reaction, in reaction to the Catholic understanding of the church. And that is that there was one Catholic church and it was seen as the universal church, the central Roman church, they saw it as at, at the time. And the reformers came along and they protested against that idea and observed that most of the time when the church, the, the word church is used in the New Testament, something like 98% of the time, it's used to describe a specific body of believers. In other words, it's used like this, to the church in Ephesus, not to the worldwide universal church. We do see that occasionally. We see Jesus saying to, to Peter, on this church, on this rock, I will build my church. But usually, almost always, the word is used to describe a local church. My daddy used to say, when Paul wrote that letter to the Ephesians, the, the mailman knew where to deliver the letter. But if you look more closely at that usage, what you find is this. It says to the church in Ephesus. In other words, the idea of a local church in a local area that is separate from and distinct from and could care less about other churches in that same local area, that idea is actually foreign to the New Testament. I remember a guy calling me one time to do a conference and uh, we worked through the details of it, the date and so on and what uh, conference I'd be doing. And then as we wound down the conversation, I said, now, by the way, if you can uh, do anything to invite other churches in the area, perhaps your association or other churches, even of other other denominations, uh, we'd love to have them come in. And I'll never forget his response. He said, well, you know, quite honestly, I don't care about the other churches in my area. And I thought to myself, I think you ought to care because we are a part We are a part of a body, our local body, our local churches in the local area, and a part of the worldwide church of God. And we do well to grasp hold of both of those things. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 from the message says, we need something larger and even more comprehensive. Observation number eight, spiritual gifts, natural talents is experiences, our personality, and a few other things all work together to point you to your ministry. Scripture says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them all. There are different kinds of service. There are different gifts, and there is different service that you can do, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, there is the same God at work. And the point is this, in church world, I hear often hear a very great distinction between a spiritual gift on one hand and a natural talent on the other. And from my viewpoint, both spiritual gifts and natural talents are both given from God and are to be used for God in the work of God. And in that sense, it doesn't make that much difference whether it is a spiritual gift or whether it is a natural talent. They are both given by God and they are to both to be used for God. Rick Warren has this helpful acrostic that spills that spells out the word shape, and he asks us to imagine how God has shaped us. That is, what spiritual gifts do we have? What do you have a heart for? Do you have a heart for kids? Do you have a heart for the finances of the church and seeing that everything is done decently in, in order that way? What abilities do you have? Can you work with wood? Can you work with machines? Can you work with electronics? Can you work with kids? Are you uh, musical? What gifts and abilities do 
do, do you have? Natural talents do you have? What is your personality like? I know I've really struggled with this one over the years. I remember when I first started uh, studying spiritual gifts, I ran across this uh, quote from, from one bo- book, uh, someone who had the gift of teaching. And this person with the gift of teaching said, you know what? I could be perfectly content sitting in a dark room, a dark office, surrounded by books. And someone bring me some food from time to time, and I'll simply pass out my notes through a slot in the door. And I remember thinking to myself, that is exactly how I feel. And my pastor would come by from time to time. I was a minister of education then, and my pastor would uh, come by and try to coach me from time to time. And he'd say to me, you need to get out with the uh, the folks, and you need to glad hand, and you need to be with people, and people don't care what you know till you know that till they know that you care, and so on and so on. And there was some wisdom in that, and I needed to listen to that. And I benefited from some of his coaching a long time along those lines. But I remember struggling with that. And I remember thinking to myself, God, is there any place in this world, is there any place in this world that you have for a person with a personality like mine, a person who thrives on lots of time alone in a dark room covered with books, and a person who longs to pass out my notes through a slot in the door. And it's such an interesting dynamic because here now 30 years later this is exactly what god has me doing i work all day alone i'll say to my wife a goodbye to my wife when she goes off to teach school in in the, in the morning and occasionally i'll see somebody else during the day but generally speaking i spend all day every day by myself and i'm perfectly content doing that I'm perfectly content spending my whole life surrounded by books. These are electronic books, and in my case, Logos Bible software books, and passing my notes out through a slot in the door, which for me is an internet wire through which I can distribute my study to about 1,600 Bible study leaders that, that, that use my, my lessons. And no matter what personality you have, whether you are extroverted or introverted, whether you are a thinker or a feeler or whoever you are, God can use you. He made your personality and he can use your personality for the kingdom of God. He gave you spiritual gifts, and he can use your spiritual gifts for the advancement of the kingdom of God. He gave you natural talents, and he can use your natural talents for the kingdom of God. Rick Warren points out two other things, personality and experiences. The experiences, the heartbreaking experiences we've had, the educational experiences we've had, the work experiences we've had, all of these can be used to help us to serve, to advance the kingdom of God. Number nine, the most important gifts are the behind the scenes gifts. Again, from the message we read, as a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. You could live without an eye. You could live without a hand. You could live without a foot, for instance, but you can't live without a stomach. You can't live without the liver. You can't live without a kidney. You can't live without your heart. Those internal organs are more important than the external things. And those those behind the scenes things are more important than the more public gifts. I remember my dad teaching me this. He served as pastor of First Baptist Clovis, New Mexico for a decade or so and uh, resigned two or three months before he actually left to go back to the mission field. And in those last two or three months, uh, family after family after family asked him and said, Pastor, we'd like to take you out to lunch uh, one, one more time before you leave for the, for the, for the mission f- field. And he said, we're leaving town. He reflected on those, co- those conversations and person after person after person said to him, Pastor, I just want to thank you for being there when my son was in the hospital. I want to thank you for being there when my wife was dying. I want to thank you for being there. I want to thank you for being there. Those private, behind-the-scenes ministries my dad discovered and my dad taught me were more important. In other words, no one came to my dad, according to my dad's testimony. No one came. He's a very able communicator, a very able teacher, yet no one came to him in those final days and said, Walter, you preach such a fine sermon. And the the private ministries of the body of Christ are often more important than the public ministries. We see a great example of this in Acts 4, where we read of Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle calls Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. I think we would paraphrase it, Mr. Encouragement. When he came to Jerusalem, now we're talking about Paul here. I've skipped down just a bit. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Paul tried to join the disciples, but the disciples were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple, but Barnabas. But Mr. Encouragement took him 
and personally brought him to the, the, the apostles. And you got to wonder where the church would be. Not where would it be if we did not have an apostle Paul, but where would the church be today if we didn't have a Barnabas who behind the scene encouraged the church to accept the apostle Paul that he might do the ministry that God had for him. Number 10, we discover gifts primarily by experimentation. Now, I don't have a chapter and verse on this, but this seems to be the near universal teaching of about everybody I've read on this. And Rick Warren says it this way, the best way to discover your gifts and abilities is to experiment with different areas of service. I could have taken a hundred gift and ability test as a young man and would have never discovered that I was gifted at teaching because I had never done it. And I think about my own, own, own experience between college and seminary. I did this, it's on this summer evangelism team. I was actually the music minister on, on that team. But we did some seminars, some Saturday morning s seminars from time to time. And I taught either on evangelism or, or discipleship. And I'll never forget that when I taught, people came up to me afterwards and they said, I learned when you taught, I I learned. And uh, had I not experimented, had not I dabbled, I would never have come to understand that I had a gift for teaching. Rick Warren goes on, on to say, I was, it was only after I began accepting opportunities to speak that I saw the result, received confirmation from others, and realized God has gifted me to do this. Many books get this discovery process backwards. They say, discover your spiritual gifts, and then you will know what ministry you are supposed to have. It actually works exactly the opposite way. Just start serving, experimenting with different ministries, and then you will discover your gifts until you're actually involved in serving. Unless until you are the man in the arena involved in serving, you're not going to know what you're good at. Peter Wagner has this wonderful ac acrostic, and this is point 11. We do, all, do well to all affirm the gifting of others. And he tells us five things we can do to discover our gifts. We've talked to some of them already. Number one, explore the possibilities. Experiment with as many as possible. Examine your feelings. When you get near your spiritual gifting, you'll feel like this is really important. You'll feel like this is what I was born to do. Evaluate your effectiveness. Are you any good at this? I like to say, if you go to the hospital and people feel worse when you leave than they did when you got there, you probably do not have the gift of mercy. I think about my own life and I've received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds invitations to speak primarily to tra trained teachers about how they can teach better and how they can double their classes in two years or less. But I've never had an invitation to any church ever to go and sing somewhere. And as I evaluate my effectiveness as a singer, I have to say I am thoroughly mediocre. I have a kind of choir voice. I'm not a terrible singer. I can sing a little bit, but uh, not, not very much. And as I evaluate my, my effectiveness, I discover I'm not, not very good. And I've heard singers in particular get this wrong. I've heard them say many times over the years, you know what? I don't want you to listen to my voice. I, don't want, you, I want you to listen to my heart. And I want to say to you, I got a good heart. I don't want to listen to your heart. I want to listen to your voice. I want you to evaluate your effectiveness. And if you're not very good at singing, don't try to sing. But it's the last one I want to draw your attention to here, and that is expect confirmation from the body, which means that we ought to expect confirmation from the body, the body of Christ. It also means that I ought to try to affirm the gifting of others. And you might spend a little time, teacher, toward the end, just talking about, let's do this. Let's just spend a little time going around the room, and what gifting can you affirm in others? If you do this, I would encourage you to be uh, very careful. If you've got 50 people in the room, it won't make so much difference that you don't include everything everyone because you won't have time to include everyone. But if you have 10 people in the room, and I think a small group really is a better, better a group of about 10. If you have 10 people in the group, you might write down something that you see as a gifting in, in the people in the room. And as the group uh, shares the gifting they see in one another, uh, you might mark off uh, some check marks there. And if somebody in the room has been left out, then you might want to speak up because that person might get a little discouraged if everybody in the room, somebody said about them, I think you have the gift of mercy and I think you have the gift of administration and I think you have the gift of, uh, of, of teaching and so on. And there's one person there who has been kind of left out. That could be kind of dis uh, discouraging to them. All right, my last point. It is more important. It is more important that you serve well than to name your gift accurately. And again, I don't have a chapter and verse on this, but I do have this quote. We're not even sure about the nature of the spiritual gift that 
with which Timothy was endowed. The most important thing to Paul is that Timothy actually use his spiritual gifts. And the same is true, whether you know whether or not to name it, whether your people know whether or not to name it, the most important thing is they discover what they can do in the body of Christ. And may God richly bless you as you teach your people to discover how God has gifted them to serve to advance the kingdom of God.